Good afternoon, it's Warren Porter. I'm gonna be your host for this afternoon. I am the president of Iron Gate Wine. Uh, we sell private collections of uh, Canadian sellers to the rest of the world. And the podcast is called Behind Fine Wine. And what we wanna do in this podcast is interview people that are behind the world of fine wine while at the same time having a great bottle of wine with us. So the, uh, today we're going to be having the 2004 Latour uh, with my friend Nick from uh, Wine Owners from London, UK. So thank you for Delighted coming all the way here. over here, not just to do this, but certainly for the, for the wine. And, um, uh, and uh, we're going to be having some great discussions this week and we hope to be doing some good business with wine owners. So um, uh, first off, before we get started, might as well be civilized about this and uh, try a little bit of this. Cheers. So cheers. Cheers. So this is an 04 Latour, which is obviously quite young. Uh, I opened it up last night at about 10 p.m. It's now uh, four in the afternoon. Uh, so this has been double decanted uh, using the Riedel Eve, which is one of my favorite decanters. So this beautiful piece of glass is what we've double decanted this in. And, uh, and I think it's showing very well. Mm. It's gorgeous. It's got um, great mineralogy. There's a real sort of stoniness to the fruit. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that kind of classic cassis yep. um, infusion. And, and iodine, and as you mentioned and, before. And iodine, yep. yeah, absolutely. Beautiful wine. Yeah. A really great, great wine. So, but we're not here to talk about wine. We're here to talk about wine owners. And I had been introduced to wine owners I believe as I was literally out looking for the answer to a problem, which is always what you kind of want to have somebody here. And, and so um, maybe where we could start for um, our, our viewer base is to get, let's start with a very high level of how you would explain wine owners almost to your mom to understand uh, from, a, from, a, from a, a macro perspective what wine owners is and what they do. Okay, so wine owners is a platform for collectors and enthusiasts who are into wine. Um, and it's a platform that provides a means to be able to organize and catalog wine collections to find out more about wines that you either own or aspire to own and provides an easy, direct um, route into the secondary market. So it makes it easy for people to buy and sell between each other. Okay, perfect. So um, when you and I were talking before, one of the things that I, one of the, the in, in, in one of the things that I thought about wine owners that was particularly uh, interesting and extremely unique was that there's seller organization categorization, the secondary market, as you say, which is the trading, selling, buying, and selling between people between on the market. Yeah. Um, and the understanding of the even the, the, the value and, the, and the, the, the pulling of data in from outside sources so that you know, you're not uh, serving a 2004 Latour to your mother-in-law because you don't know exactly how much you paid for that 2004 Latour, right? You can make sure that she gets the stuff that's perfect for and, her. And what it's worth today. And what it's worth today, exactly. Sure. So when we were talking uh, about wine owners a little bit before, the, um, I said, okay, well then this section looks a little bit like Seller Tracker, but then there's so much more to it than that. So, so mm. why don't we dig deep a little bit into how uh, an average customer first, not a corporation, not a, not a wine storage facility, because sure. we'll talk about that too, yes. would, would um, subscribe to wine owners and what they would use it for and what they're going to get the most out of it. So let's think about it from a, just from a user perspective. Sure. So as, as you quite rightly say, it's, it's not just one thing. We're not just a point solution for people who want a set of management tool or, or somebody who wants to um, sell their wine. Uh, it's, it's a platform that's designed to make it as easy as possible for time poor wine collectors to essentially live their life in wine through a uh, online platform. So um, if, you look at, if you look at the collection management side of what we do, yes, there are lots of people who do lots of things around uh, organizing a, a wine collection like Sutter Tracker, who do it absolutely brilliantly. Uh, there are lots of sources of data uh, to help you understand what your Robert wine Parker, is worth. Janice Robinson, oh, pricing uh, data, right. tasting data, maturity data, right? Tasting data, drinking window data, uh, scores, of course. Um, 
And pricing data. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's lots of that around. And, and one of the frustrating things I think that collectors often experience is that it's incredibly time consuming to pull that whole picture yeah. of a particular wine that you either own or are considering what to do with, drink it now or keep it and lay it down for longer, or a wine that you're interested in buying. It's incredibly time consuming to yeah. bounce around half a dozen websites um, to kind of figure out. Um, the whole story. Yeah. Um, so one of the goals was to make it easy to do that and right. to um, take away that that effort in kind of doing online research and, sure. and, and creating something that was a platform through which you could get organized, figure out what you own or figure out the wines that you're interested in owning, learn all about them through what the critics and reviewers have to say about it, understand what the relationship is between the costs of the wine and what its market value is today, understanding where that may be going from a kind of um, a performance over time yep. perspective, and all of that. And that's, that's of course, you know, the, 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 the precondition of figuring out what to do with it yeah. is, is price discovery. Yeah, and then because the market is, I mean, certainly on a, a significant recovery from yes. what it did a few years ago. So people are really looking at, I've heard more often in the last couple of months, I really like the idea of drinking this wine, but I mean, the price is, I cannot justify that. So it's great to have that at your fingertips, to be it, able to see that. It is, and to figure out, you know, which wines you may want to sell on in order yeah. to either fund more wine purchases yeah. or whatever else you want to do with it, and which wines actually you really do want to drink and feel that you can justify drinking. Yeah. So um, me, and, this is a and this is a great wine in point, may I say. You yeah. know, 2004 is, uh, uh, I think, a, a hugely uh, underestimated vintage. The mm. wines are, as you say, still incredibly young. Um, there's enormous depth to them. And yet, you know, you can, cert you can pick up a Latour for, um, you know, half the price. Or in the case of Latour, perhaps even a third to a quarter of the price of something like the tour 2010. Yeah. So why wouldn't you enjoy this wine or a case or two of this wine over the next 30 years? Well, it's funny you say that because I get so many collectors who say, Warren, what do you think about it? I'm looking at buying a bunch of 09 and 10 Bordeaux. And I went, not for, not for nothing, you're 65 years old. Right. So why don't we pick up 82s, 86s, 95s that you can drink and still have a lot of life left in them? Because the 2010s, are going to be a very long time for they now. Are going to be long but time. I'm going to wind it back a little bit because let's talk about the practicality of I have a uh, I as a potential customer client have a very large seller. It's disorganized. I don't know what I have. I don't know where anything goes. So I take a look at wine owners from a high level and hear what you say and go, okay. So this will help me manage my collection and uh, and and help me understand what to drink, wine, its values, all the things that you mentioned. What do I do? because I've got a whole bunch of wine that is disorganized and usually the hardest, the most, the heaviest lifting is out of the gate to get it in. Absolutely. Right? So, how, so how would one do that or hire some, because I know we do that for clients all the right. time, but, but what does it yeah, look yeah. like for wine owners? Yep, so it looks like um, sending spreadsheets over to us for okay. large collections. Typically it's multiple spreadsheets because wines are often stored in different places. Yep. Um, uh, it depends what your interest is, of course. We have one, one or two members on the platform with enormous collections, and we saw that they were busy using our online wizards to add those wines in, and it's quick to do that. Um, but we called them up and said, look, well, why don't we help you? Send your lists over to us, and we'll do an upload for you, and, and we do that you know, within a couple of days. Oh, great. Um, uh, and one of them said, no, Nick, this is part of the process. Okay. This is part of me reacquainting myself yeah, to nice. the last 20 years of wine purchasing yeah, because I really don't have a clue yeah. how much I bought in totality. Yeah. And uh, this, is my, this is my stock take process. Yeah, good. So it just depends. It's fair to say the majority of our uh, users 
uh, of our collector members, if you like, yeah. um, use us to get started to upload their wines. And okay. that's either on a download out of something else that they're using or it's requesting spreadsheets okay. from uh, their storage facilities. Okay, so now I've got all of my collection. It's uploaded in and I'm sure there's all the typical ways that you are you know, sorting and mixing and matching and playing around with them. And that's terrific. And, and it is, it's pulling, it's pulling pricing data in from where, Nick? So the principal source is Wine Searcher. Okay, so, so retail pricing. It's retail pricing. Yeah. It's um, we're processing around about 120 million price points a year. Wow. Okay. Um, and we're then average Wine Searcher pricing. No, so. no. So what we're aiming to do is try and provide a a guideline of the price at which, if you wanted to sell your wine tomorrow, pre commissions. Yep. Um, you'd be able to you'd be able to achieve. It's kind of this, right? So it's not. You, I mean, there's never going to be an exact. You've got auction numbers in Asia, auction numbers in North America, retail pricing, consignment pricing. So with it's, a lot of bottles of wine, it can be in the sure. Yeah, I mean, it's working on the it's working on the simple principle that if there's a cluster of market prices from reputable sources at or around the market low, yeah, then it is around that market low that the market. Is, is going to is going to sell first. Right. So when you're looking at so using that example, when you're looking at wine searcher, you're looking around the market low. Because I know when we price ours for the wines that we take from Canadian collectors and put them on wine searcher, one of my standard principles is you need to be one of the bottom two or three sure. least expensive uh, in all of the United States anyway for us. Yes. Uh, such that those wines turn. Right, so what a guy is selling Absolutely. it for in Beverly Hills in a store is quite irrelevant, which impacts the average price. So you're taking it more down towards the bottom. We are. We're trying to identify the point of market liquidity, which is realistic to yes. expect that you might want to sell your wine. There's no point pretending that the market's something other than it is. The market is the market, like yeah. any other, like any other market. Yeah. And very small differences in pricing can have a profound effect sure. on the speed. Or slowness with which, or your market sells or doesn't sell. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. We're we're really very focused on. It. Of course, it varies. So if you're looking at selling relatively more recent vintages of Bordeaux classified growths, then there's much more data in the market, and we're much more uh, predisposed towards being able to find a very accurate price point for that at or around that market low cluster. If on the other hand you're talking about an older vintage of say a Grand Cru Burgundy where there's an awful lot less data available yes. in the market then the pricing will tend to um, uh, move away from the market low to much more towards the market mid. So reflecting uh, supply, reflecting scarcity, reflecting relative demand as well of course. Now, the other thing that, that brings up a, a, another point, because judging from your accent, you're not from here. I'm not from here. So, therefore... <laughs> I'm not from here. <laughs> therefore, <laughs> pricing information, as you know, is, is fluid, but it's also, it is, repra it is um, a, a product also of tax, importation tax, wine held in bond, which is a, a specific to the UK, sure. wine that comes in with no tax applied, such as Hong Kong, and wine which is heavily taxed to pay for our magnificent healthcare system, such as in Canada. So, uh, when, you, when, so when you look at that pricing data, does one say, um, just show me the pricing data germane to North America or the United States or Canada? Correct. Or, or how does that work? Because they can, as you know, be wildly different. Sure. So our, our pricing regions are A, Europe and B, North America. Okay. And we've been collecting North American data for as long as we've been collecting European data. So I data. kind of turn that switch and say, show me North American data? Right. In fact, when you Great. set up an account, you determine what currency and what pricing data okay. you wish to set as your base currency and pricing data set uh, and because you're curious you can then pivot between different data sets and different currencies if you're interested in doing that as well. Well we do that a fair bit uh, here because a lot of the wine that we will sell will be into Asia so it's yes. important to understand what the market is looking yes. like in Asia so that we are not underselling or overselling on behalf of our, yeah. of our clients. Then the uh, that's on the pricing and the, data. And, and the purchasing side of the Asian market we find is quite dependent upon European pricing data. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I yes. didn't. Yeah. Whereas the amount of of the amount of available pricing data out of Asia isn't nearly as great, and therefore yeah. it's far more difficult to be able to um, judge 
uh, pricing levels based on based on those those geographies. And then when I look at um, um, uh, uh, maturity windows, mm -hmm. uh, I often will look at the the people that I follow, whether it is a Parker or a Spectator or a Robinson or, or whatever. And so, am I pulling in the feeds from the places that I subscribe to, or are you pushing on to me a particular feed to say this is supposed to be from this time to this time? Um, so, in terms of drinking windows, yeah, do specifically, I right. um, you, you're presented with drinking windows that are mean of everybody's drinking windows. Okay, so, the, so it's the, the, the wisdom of the masses. As they say. It's the wisdom of the masses. So if, on the other hand, you're interested in seeing your Parker reviews or Venice Media, so Galoni and Neil Martin or Jancis Robinson, then as subscribers to those services, you will be able to then see the same content on the Wine Owners platform yep. as a subscriber to Venice Media or Robert Parker or Chances. Um, and then you'll obviously be able to see their individual drinking windows as well. Okay. Um, uh, of course, there are many wines where drinking windows don't exist from a critic source, right. uh, and and on a um, on a like basis, we create those drinking windows. Okay. So we have we we have we have some maths that essentially applies drinking windows to wines which haven't been given a drinking window by a, a, a wine reviewer um, based on the similarity of that wine with a cohort of, of wines that okay. are similar that do have those drinking okay, windows. Okay, that's interesting. The one thing that, that also brings up another point, the one thing that I've always found inside of Seller Tracker as an example is an inventory control system is the community data, yes. right? And I can see your data and you can see my data. And it was one of the reasons that the Parker data and the Robinson data had to be kept private because mm -hmm. otherwise you're taking their proprietary content yes. and you're putting it out for the world. Yes. So is there, is there the community aspect or in, inside of the wine owners platform, management platform or is it more about you and the things you subscribe to? Yeah, so today it's about you and the things that you subscribe okay. to and, and, and going forward that that's, that community element is going to grow. Okay. Um, uh, for now, if your view of the tour 2004 is that the drinking window that was we've got another half provided hour. that's it tops. right exactly <laughs> <laughs> um, was too great to yeah. to uh, likely to to conservative then you can put your own drinking windows in and those drinking windows then override the system drinking windows gotcha so you can personalize the drinking windows to your own palate Gotcha. Now, one of the things that I thought was very, very different and, and really piqued my interest about wine owners is the concept of trading mm -hmm. within the community that you've built yep. and being able to put it out. Now, now, Iron Gate takes collections from Canada and sells them in the United States mm -hmm. for a regulatory reason. Mm -hmm. Um, in the UK, of course, you are more free to trade um, uh, within and, and outside of bond. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, it's, a, it's, it's, it's in between where you have the ability of consigning to a retailer or selling to an auction house. So explain to me how the platform works with respect to somebody saying, look, I'm 75 years old, I got 10,000 bottles of wine, I should at least put some of these up to possibly make a sale. So what would that look like? Um, and, and where is that feasible to do today? Is it mostly UK based? So to do it's feasible to do in, in, in many geographies. It's not feasible to do in North America as a North America consumer. That's something that we're working on and, and could well be something working we're going to be collaborating yep, on yep, indeed. Yep. Um, so that we, we work within the regulatory frameworks that exist that prohibit private individuals to sell to other private individuals God forbid. direct. But that doesn't mean that a two-sided market can't exist sure. and counterparties um, be in background in order to facilitate the exchange or, or, or the sale of wine through the exchange. Okay. Um, so if, you look at, if you look at the European market, any European market um, uh, is easy to, to sell wine direct, um, as is in Asia. But the, but the typical reality is that most Asian pur purchases are made outside of Asia. Yeah, there's very little wine trading that goes on within 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 Hong Kong, for example. Mm. Um, so, if you're a 
British consumer or a French consumer, you can, you can offer your wine directly for sale on the platform. You go into your, into your cellar, into your online collection, um, and go straight into uh, a process that makes it easy for you to offer your wine for sale, where you can see in context the price for wine, the price history, the relative value of that wine against other wines, uh, other, other wines of the same vintage or other vintages of the same wine. In other words, it gives you plenty of scope to be able to do your own research before deciding what you want to sell, what you want to keep, and then at what price you want but to sell. But you're facilitating price. that. I mean, this is not like trading a, 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 a currency. It's not like, I mean, this is trading a physical good. So, so that, that needs to be facilitated. So I assume that one of the main things that you're doing is saying, look, this wine that is now offered up for sale exists. Sure. It's real. We've, we've authenticated it. Um, we know the seller and, uh, and we know that it will be made available when the purchaser wants to purchase it. So, so should I assume that that's a, a significant part of, of your process or how does yeah. that work? So, so our, role as, uh, our role as platform is to facilitate and to provide the logistic support and the oversight uh, and to ensure that the counterparties, the, the buyer and the seller, are, are, are participating in an assured environment. Okay. And to that end, we make sure that when wine is offered for sale and traded, um, that the seller is protected and the buyer is protected equally. And, there's, and that's done through a sequence of steps that makes sure that the wine is moved to us, that it's inspected upon request of the buyer, that the buyer's money is already held in a, essentially an escrow account on their behalf and has only moved to the seller once the wine the trusted um, has third been. party absolutely yeah. yeah so we're the trusted third party if terrific you um, the uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about um, is one of the things that we're discussing for the improvement of the customer experience for our own collectors yes is the possible integration of the wine owners platform on a commercial level such that when they store or sell wine with us or have it in a combination of in our cellar and in their home, that they're seeing that data. So is your platform, your data, and your services just as accessible on a commercial level to another storage facility um, uh, such as ours? Yes, uh, and, and or retailers, uh, if, that, if that's a... Sure. Yeah, so today about 60% of our revenues come from just that model. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, we provide a, a technology platform uh, that, that, that you configure, that's configurable to your business requirements and to the needs of your customers. Okay. Uh, that's, 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 that's your brand, that's your platform. Yeah. Um, and we provide a, an immersive interface for your clients to see and explore the wines that they have stored with you as well as, as you say, the wines that they have stored at home. Yeah. Or their country house you want to see it as a holistic right? it's a 360 my cottage degree my view. home my storage facility right. my yeah I mean it's a 360 degree view because wine is very rarely stored in all the same place yeah um, and that enables them to do that at the same time there's there's the there's a huge back office if you like yeah that, that provides uh, a, a complete infrastructure for for a wine business from uh, pre-advising of wine that's due for arrival, to the landing of wine, to the allocation of wine to space in a warehouse, to the movement of wine within the warehouse, to reconciliation and stock taking, and to obviously the, the, the wine being called off or, or requested for delivery out. Right, right, okay. Um, and, uh, and we cover all of that along with, with uh, APIs for pushing wine that is then requested to be sold. Yeah. Through into an e-commerce platform or the like, such as such as Iron Gate has yeah. in in Buffalo, um, uh, or into anything else that that um, uh, uh, the wine data needs to be pushed into. So we we provide a, a complete environment. Well, I'll tell you this: it would have been very nice for us to have had something like that when we started 14 years ago, because there was absolutely nothing on the market, so we had to build it from scratch. And so we've kind of built up what we've had, and, and so I'm, um, I'm excited to see the possibilities of things we might be able to do, as I said, for our customers with wine owners. Um, and I don't want to keep you much longer, because we're going to go and enjoy some more of this wine. But before I go, I always like to find out, I've, I've, I meet very few people who start in wine. 
they come from a completely different background typically and there's a catalyst that says I'm going to go into something else so uh, you've been with wine owners for I think you said five years yeah so, so you're founder of the company you started yeah the we started the company we founded it in 2011 we spent most of 2011 figuring out what we were going to do how yeah. we were going to do it and then we started coding the platform so we started spending money in January 2012. And what would possess you to start up a wine management or, or I don't know how you encapsulate a wine inventory management and sure. a, a platform from what you were doing before? Yeah, especially if you've never been, never been in the wine trade before. Yeah, absolutely, right? yeah. yeah. And so my background had been A, in information management and customer relationship management and B, in, in tech. Okay, um, but and, you had an interest in wine, so it's the marrying of something that you really liked with right. something that you knew. Right, Not so you I, know you know, wine, like so many people who might consider themselves wine collectors or wine enthusiasts, I, I've probably been on a very similar journey to them, which yeah. is, which is having, a, having a, a special moment where I realized that spending a little bit more money on a bottle of wine got me a lot more enjoyment and as I started to have more discretionary income to spend to I started to build my wine collection out so all the challenges that people who may be listening uh, to this uh, to this video may have experienced themselves in terms of being on top of their collection and knowing where they are with their wines given that their start point was one of passion rather mm. than perhaps investment. Yeah. Um, I, I went through that same journey and became increasingly frustrated at the lack of platforms that were out there that would provide a complete um, uh, solution to, 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 my, uh, to my issues. Yeah. Um, there were lots of, as we said earlier, there were lots of things that did one thing or another, but nothing that enabled me to organize my entire life in wine in one place and well, that's what I needed. And, the, and the, one of the most important things on that is I've found that most of my collectors are not interested in the technology per se. They want the ease of use. I don't want a remote control with 250 buttons on it. I want something that makes it easy using technology, not technology for the sake of technology. Right. And I think that was the one thing that I was struck by when I was going through your platform and, and looking at it, I could see it through the eyes of my clients and see that it was informative yet relatively simple so I don't have to be a uh, you know, software engineer to understand how this works. Right. And so that was, and that was, that was our starting point. And that was our starting yeah. point too. Yeah. We, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not technical. Yeah. Uh, I am a wine collector. I understand technology, yeah. uh, and we were able to put ourselves in the shoes of our target market. Yeah, uh, and that's that's been the focus ever since. Really, yeah. perfect. Well, listen, I very much appreciate our time here today. Likewise. So, uh, cheers to cheers. that. Again, cheers thank that. you for coming uh, to on. Toronto. Um, and so, I'm going to wrap up our time here with uh, Nick Martin from Wine Owners. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing some business that we might be able to do together. And I look forward to presenting another uh, industry insider uh, behind the world of fine wine uh, in our next uh, show. So with that, uh, I say cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. And uh, cheers to you, cheers Nick. Again. Thank you.